Welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atu Kweisen, and I'm a professor of English at Stanford University. Today, I'm going to be talking about Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart and why things fall apart in the first place. Uh, this will be done firstly through the lens of spatial arrangements in the novel, but uh, concurrently, through the idea of tragedy, because Okonko is a tragic no uh, character. The novel is set among a fictional Igbo tribe in eastern Nigeria in the late 19th century, and this fictional tribe is called Umofia. Okonko, who is the central character, is one of the lords of this tribe of Umofia. Now, the first special arrangement in the novel pertains to Okonko's compound. The novel is divided into three parts. Part one, everything happens in Omofia, and we get examples of Omofia's uh, value systems, uh, their culture, their judicial system. But the central spatial logic of part one is that everything that happens in Omofia either starts from or returns into Okonko's household. And so the household becomes a crucial organizing principle for all the various threads in part one. Part two uh, is different from part one because at the end of part one, Okonko inadvertently shoots the son of uh, another uh, person uh, in the tribe. So he's exiled for seven years and so the second part, we find Okonko in exile in his motherland of Mbanta. Now, unlike in part one, where everything was threaded through Okonko's household, in part two, Okonko receives news about what is happening in warfare through his very good friend, Obierika, who comes from warfare every so often, once every two years, to come and regale his friend with stories from Omofia. So you can see that in between part one and part two, the centrality of uh, Okonko's household has shifted. It is not as central to the narration of events as it was in part one. Part three, we find Okonko returning to Omofia, but he returns to an Omofia which is much changed. The narrative no longer centers exclusively on Okonko's household. It is split between Okonko's household and the Christian, the new Christian church that we also find in the novel. So we see that the centralization of Okonko's household and compound for threading all the various uh, aspects of the, of the story, uh, of the narration, is now split between at least two sides. So we see Okonko's household, we also find uh, it in uh, threaded through the Christian church. Now this, as it were, very slow uh, narrative decentralization of uh, Okonko's uh, compound or household is accompanied by another spatial dynamic, which is very subtle and in fact transcends Okonko's household entirely. In the novel, we have two specific locations that are explicitly identified with different ideas of communal values and uh, non-communal values. The first uh, space is the space of the marketplace. Another word that is used for the marketplace in the novel is ilo. Now the marketplace is the place of the gathering of the tribesmen of uh, uh, the judicial uh, system. The judges sit in court at the marketplace and also annual events like the wrestling, the great wrestling uh, match, which happens every year. Now, all these are hosted at the marketplace. And so the marketplace becomes the center or the focal point of the affirmation of shared cultural values. Opposed to the marketplace is a place called the evil forest. No one goes into the evil forest. The evil forest is where 
uh, the people of Omofia cast away the people with the unnameable diseases. So diseases that cannot be treated, the, the, the people are cast into the evil forest. Also the place where uh, twins are cast out because twins are considered anomalous in this fictional uh, tribe. And so the evil forest becomes a space of dread, of the negative sacred, whereas the marketplace becomes the space of the affirmation of social values. Now, something happens in the course of the novel that, as it were, alters this dyadic relationship of marketplace on the one hand and, um, and uh, uh, evil forest on the other. But to understand the, as it were, the collapse of this uh, dyad or this dyadic relationship, I want us to read a little bit from the novel itself. And the film, we're going to read two passages. The first passage has to do with a big gathering in the marketplace. Now, the first passage uh, relates to a big gathering in the marketplace to discuss a great insult that has been visited uh, against the Umofians by a neighboring tribe. And basically, the problem is that a young woman from Umofia goes to that tribe to the market and she is killed on the way to the market. It's not clear how and why she's killed, but she is killed. And Umofians are feared uh, soldiers. They are feared warriors. And so they come together to discuss what to do about this egregious and terrible insult. And this is what we see. In the morning, the marketplace was full. There must have been about 10,000 men there all talking in low voices. At last, Ubulufe Izeugu stood up in the midst of them and bellowed four times, Umofia Kweno! And on each occasion, he faced a different direction and seemed to push the air with a clenched fist. And 10,000 men answered, Yeah! each time. Then there was perfect silence. Ubulufe Izeugu was a powerful orator and was always chosen to speak on such occasions. He moved his hand over his white head and stroked his white beard. He then adjusted his cloth, which was passed under his right armpit and tied above his left shoulder. Umo fiakueno! He bellowed the fifth time and the crowd yelled in answer. And then suddenly, like one possessed, he shot out his left hand and pointed in the direction of Imbaino and said through gleaming white teeth, firmly clenched, those sons of wild animals have dared to murder a daughter of Umofia. He threw his head down and gnashed his teeth and allowed a murmur of suppressed anger to sweep the crowd. When he began again, the anger on his face was gone. And in its place, a sort of smile hovered, more terrible and more sinister than the anger. And in a clear, unemotional voice, he told Morphia how their daughter had gone to market at Imbaino and had been killed. That woman, said Eziugo, was the wife of Ubuifi Udo. And he pointed to a man who sat near him with a bowed head. The crowd then shouted with anger and thirst for blood. Many others spoke, and at the end, it was decided to follow the normal course of action. An ultimatum was immediately dispatched to Imbaino and asked them to choose between war on the one hand and on the other the offer for a young man and a virgin as compensation. Now, it is clear from this same um, uh, uh, extract, but also from various other uh, sections of the novel, that the marketplace is a place of gathering. 
It is a place of the affirmation of shared communal values. It is the place where the tribesmen express their shared and holistic vitality in one voice. And so we hear, Mwifiakweno, and they say, yeah. The evil forest, as I mentioned a moment ago, is a place of, of uh, negation, of anomaly. It's a place where no one steps in the evil forest. In fact, in the novel, even though we have several uh, scenes set in the marketplace, there is no scene set in the evil forest. So we, us as readers do not actually know what happens in the evil forest except that something is going to occur in amongst the people of Omofia that is going to change the status of the evil forest for good. And this happens on, with the arrival of the Christians. When the Christians first arrive amongst the people of Omofia, they come preaching the gospel according to their God and to their son, Jesus Christi. Now, the arriving Christians pose a problem for the Morphians. And the problem is that they come neither as uh, warmongers nor as purveyors of trade. In other words, they do not come to fight and do not come to, they do not come to trade. And so because they do not come for either, the people of Morphia are slightly uh, bewildered as to how to, 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 to treat them. At any rate, the Christians have a very simple request. They just want a piece of land on which to build their church. The Omophians huddle together and decide that, well, since these people do not come as enemies or come uh, for trade, let us give them a, a part of the evil forest. And they will soon have the chance to prove themselves with their God uh, against our gods. Uh, gods such as Amadura of the Thunder and others. So they give them a slice of the evil forest and everyone sort of turns away and leaves the, the, the new Christians to their own devices. Except that there is suppressed animation amongst the people of Omophia because they are sure without fail that something terrible is going to happen to the new church. A week passes, nothing happens. A second week passes, nothing happens. After seven weeks, they now come to understand, they being the people of Omofia, come to understand that the church has something which is really powerful. And so after the seventh week, the church begins to gain its first converts. Now, among its first converts are uh, parents of uh, twins. As I mentioned earlier, twins are considered anomalous and so they're cast away into the evil forest. So parents of twins begin to convert themselves to the Christian church. But the other group which gets uh, converted really quickly are a group called the Osus. The Osus in the novel are a cult group, a cult group dedicated to a deity. And the rules of uh, being part of this uh, deity uh, cult was that the um, Osus could not cut their hair, so their hair always remained uncut. Secondly, they could not uh, interact with the freeborn. For example, they couldn't fetch uh, water from the river at the same time as the freeborn. But most importantly, they could not intermarry with the freeborn. Now, because they had the status of uh, being uh, dedicated to the deity which is sacred, this sacred status, in a way, explains their marginalization. But in fact, their marginalization also pertains to a social hierarchy within Omofia. So Omofia is largely meritocratic. We find earlier that Okonko, for example, had no parental wealth. He didn't come from a big family, but he was able to rise through the dint of sheer hard work to become one of the lords of the clan. So this tells us that it is a meritocracy, but it is a meritocracy which is nevertheless founded on a series of exclusions. And one of the exclusions is, of course, the Osus. Now, the conversion of Osus and other persons 
in warfare into Christianity is one of the signs of things uh, dissolving, of the center no longer holding. But in fact, something else is taking place in the relationship established between the evil forest and the marketplace. Because by converting the evil forest to a place not of evil, but of the Christian sacred, what has happened is that the old dyadic relationship between um, the marketplace on the one hand as a place of uh, social and communal affirmations and the evil forest as a place of negation and non-sociality begins to uh, change, to alter, uh, because the evil forest now becomes the site of a new form of community, a new form of community building, which is considered by the Christians at the very least as more meritocratic than the old form of, uh, of meritocracy and community building and enshrined and, and within Umofia itself. And so this uh, evil forest, its uh, uh, salience as a place of the, the dread and the negative uh, sacred begins to, it's attenuated and begins to shift. But the shift occurs because once the evil forest ceases uh, holding that negative valence in the society, it automatically affects the other part of the diet, which is the um, marketplace. So even though both uh, marketplace and evil forest are exactly where they were before, that is to say, in terms of the geographical locations, their salience within the symbolic apparatus of the tribe or the community changes precisely because one cannot change without necessarily impacting on the other. And we come to see the significance of this subtle change in, that, in, the, in the relationship between the, the two poles of the dyad at the very end of the novel. And this is what I want to read now. Now, the section where I'm going to read from occurs at the very end of the novel. It's, it's the penultimate chapter. Uh, but before the scene that I'm going to read out, uh, the White District Commission invites the lords of Umofia, including Okonko, to a discussion uh, because the church, the new Christian church, has reported a violation of its space. And basically, uh, to cut a very long story short, one of the new Osu converts goes to unmask a, a spirit. Uh, there's an annual festival of spirits who are masked. And the, uh, the Osu convert goes to unmask the spirit. This is considered incredible sacrilege. And so the uh, tribesmen decide to march to the church and basically burn it to the ground. The pastor, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, reports it to the, the white district commissioner and the white district commissioner invites the elders of the clan. But in fact, uh, this is a trick. He invites them, tricks them off their arms and humiliates them. There are all kinds of nasty things that happen to them. So when he finally releases them back into the tribe, the, everyone is incensed. They are very, very upset, and the tribesmen have gathered to discuss what to do. Now, it turns out that Okonko, being impatient with the oratory that is going on at the center of the market, is sitting at the very edge of the marketplace. So he's sitting at the edge of the crowd. And this is what we see. At this point, there was a sudden stir in the crowd, and every eye was turned in one direction. There was a sharp bend in the road that led from the marketplace to the white man's court and to the stream beyond it. And so no one had seen the approach of the five court messengers until they had come round the bend, a few paces from the edge of the crowd. Okonko 
was sitting at the edge. He sprang to his feet as soon as he saw who it was. He confronted the head messenger, trembling with hate, unable to utter a word. The man was fearless and stood his ground. His four men lined up behind him. In that brief moment, the world seemed to stand still, waiting. There was utter silence. The men of Umofia were merged into the mute back cloth of trees and giant creepers, waiting. The spell was broken by the head messenger. Let me pass, he ordered. What do you want here? The white man, whose power you know too well, has ordered this meeting to stop. In a flash, Okonko drew his machete. The messenger crouched to avoid the blow. It was useless. Okonko's machete descended twice and the man's head lay beside his uniform body. The waiting back clock jumped into Chimoso's life and the meeting was stopped. Okonko stood looking at the dead man. He knew that Humofia would not go to war. He knew because they had let the other messengers escape. They had broken into tumult instead of action. He discerned fright in that tumult. He heard voices asking, why did he do it? He wiped his machete on the sand and went away. There are several things of interest in this passage. We should note first of all, Okonko's anger. He's so angry that he cannot get his words out. But in fact, we've been told much earlier in the novel that Okonko has a stammer and that when he stammers and he cannot get his words out, he resorts to using his fist. Now, the thing that we must remember is that uh, the world of Umofia is a world that glorifies the fine use of language, of oratory. For example, we saw Ogwefi Iziwudu called to, 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 to charge the gathered audience at the marketplace. And so they believe that uh, proverbs are the palm oil with which words are eaten. We must also remember that this particular uh, encounter between Okonko and the uh, court messengers is taking place against the backdrop of uh, his people having gathered at the marketplace precisely to discuss what to do regarding the insult that has been visited upon their elders. But this, this uh, gathering is also a, a gathering in which there is a, a fruition of uh, good language and oratory, uh, which of course Okonko has no interest in. So there's a, a, a sort of dramatic irony in the fact that he is stuttering and not able to get out his words at precisely the same moment in the context of a background of the uh, use of beautiful language by his people. But the second thing that is really important is that Okonko realizes quite quickly that his people will not go to war. He realizes this for two reasons. One is that they break into a tumult instead of action. They allow the other messengers to escape. But the thing that is most telling for him is the question that he hears them ask, which is, why did he do it? Now, the why did he do it question is fundamentally shocking to someone of Okonko's character. And the reason is that in a previous iteration of his action, it will have meant only one thing, which is it will have meant a declaration of war. There's no question that what he did was to declare war against the obnoxious white district commissioner. And yet in this instance, he, the descent of his machete uh, generates not decisive action, but confusion, but tumult. And so when they ask, why did he do that? It is a form of epistemological impasse, or that is to say, his actions transcend 
the frames of interpretation available to them at that point. But what is this? How can an action that, you know, about a decade earlier would have meant one thing, now cannot mean that thing? To understand this, we have to track back a little bit to see how the arrival of the Christians and their occupation of the evil forest, a slice of the evil forest, has gradually shifted the cultural salience of the evil forest, which, as I said earlier, is a known place. It's a place of the sacred uh, dread. How the presence of the Christians in the evil forest has gradually altered the place of uh, sacred dread, which is the evil forest, and converted it into a space of communal building. Of course, the community that is built is different from Umufian community, but it's a community that preaches a form of egalitarianism and meritocracy. Everyone is equal in the eyes of God and his son, Jesus Christ. However, this alteration in the cultural status of evil, the evil forest and thus of sacred dread automatically also impacts upon the second term in the dyad. And the second term in the dyad is the marketplace, which as we noted earlier, is the location for the articulation and affirmation of shared cultural values. So as the evil forest is shifting from being the space of a sacred dread, it is automatically uh, connecting or altering the status of the marketplace as a place of social affirmation. And so when they ask, uh, why did he do that? They are asking from the, the locational standpoint of the marketplace, but they are asking a question that makes no sense within the context of the alterations that have taken place in their society and which are subtly signaled in the different uh, locational statuses of evil forest versus marketplace. And so Okunko understands immediately that he is no longer one of his own people. And so when his machete descends, that single descent of the machete is automatically the assertion of military values for which he's been richly rewarded earlier by his culture, the assertion of military values, but simultaneously also the final severance of him from his tribe and community. At the end of the novel, Okonko hangs himself. He commits suicide and by committing suicide, he enacts his marginalization from the perspective of the ancestors. Because anyone in the culture that commits suicide will immediately be cast out in the evil forest and be part of the unnameable. What we see here then is that the things fall apart illustrate various aspects of tragedy. In the first place, Okonko is cut from the same mold as some of the great tragic characters such as Agamemnon or Coriolanus or King Lear or, or Oedipus. He's cut from the same mold, but what he shares with them is a certain self-assurance and what we might describe simply as a sense of absolute rightness. They may be wrong, but they believe that their position is absolutely correct. Now, this absolutism I mentioned, King Lear, Coriolanus, and so on, also means that their fall from grace is even more dramatic. The reversal in fortune is even more dramatic because they are sidelined by the societies for whom their absolute assertions of value make no sense. But the other really tragic thing about Okonko in particular is that for his entire life, 
he has crafted himself to be not just a spokesperson of his own culture, but one of their prime representatives. And he was, as I mentioned earlier, rewarded from be, for being a representative figure of his community. He was rewarded for being a great uh, soldier warrior, uh, rewarded for being a great farmer, uh, rewarded for being a great parent, rewarded for his fearlessness. Now, all this lifetime of craftsmanship in order to become central to his culture comes to nothing at this moment. Because at this moment, he ceases being representational and becomes a mere individual. This is the greatest loss in the life of Okonko to cease or to suffer a dethronement from being a representative of the clan and to being a mere individual not representing any shared cultural values. And so Okonko joins the long list of really memorable, tragic characters. Thank you very much. Please remember to subscribe and share and enter your comments in the section below.